interact with the environment. And so um, for my PhD, I did a lot of work in Brazil looking at how um, people use different management practices and land use and what these effects are on tropical forest nutrient cycling. So things like nitrogen and phosphorus and even carbon storage in tropical forests. But more recently, I've been working um, more in fire ecology and invasion ecology, um, still mostly from a carbon uh, cycle perspective. Um, so this is a, just a bit about kind of my research interests and what I've been up to lately. Um, the roadmap for today, this is kind of the, on the figure on the right here is kind of what we're building up to. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to these different factors, uh, climate, invasive species, and fire. And just a quick note that these things are changing and they're all interacting with each other too. Um, and so we'll look at some of the interactions between these different factors today. Um, I'll give a, just a couple of examples from some of my work that I've done in the field on um, sagebrush, cheatgrass relationships, and um, buffelgrass. And then finally, the third part of the talk will be more about kind of a management context and some new um, framing for this. So this new framework that has come out is called RAD, which I love. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about the RAD framework and um, a couple examples like how this might be applied to sagebrush cheatgrass relationships, and then just a couple um, specific management approaches. So that's kind of where we're going today. I wanted to first start off and just kind of see where everyone is at. Um, okay, so we're gonna attempt to use this tool called Mentimeter. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with it, um, but basically if this works correctly, you should be able to see the results come in live, which is pretty cool. So I think Kayla maybe just put the link to the Mentimeter poll in the chat. So if you, um, are able to go to that link that's in the chat right now. Um, you should be able to see the first question. The first question that I wanted to just kind of gauge where people are coming from. What do your audiences already know about the interaction between fire and invasive species? And this can be just, you know, a few words, whatever you comes to your mind. Um, and I'll give you a couple minutes just to answer uh, this question here while I hopefully am able to pull up the results live. Oh, great. Okay, one answer is coming in. <laughs> great. Here, I'll share this here. Cool, okay, so Invasive species can cause excessive fuel loads. Yep, definitely. More fire equals more invasives equals more fire. Yep. <laughs> invasive species can burn more. Often invasives come in after fire. Yep. Fire is destructive and harmful to native. Yep. All of these are true. <laughs> In my Midwest prairie upbringing, fire favored natives cleaned out invasives. When I moved to Idaho, I learned that cheatgrass cheated me of that truth. Yeah, it's very situational and very context specific for sure. <laughs> okay, a couple others. They feed off each other. Um, educational audiences maybe don't know a whole lot or, or don't know much about the interactions. Yep. Um, Fire kills off invasive species, but can aid others like cheatgrass. Yep. Yeah, these are all great. Uh, the last one is invasive species can outcompete natives after fires. Cool. So that's all great. <laughs> that's a great start. <laughs> okay, one more that just came in. Elementary age kids have a general idea about fire, but maybe not about the interaction. Totally fair. Yep. Okay. Okay, I think that's a great start for us. I'm gonna stop sharing and flip back to the presentation.
Okay. So that was really helpful just to know kind of where people are at, what kind of audiences you work mostly with and, and what they may or may not be aware of. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start very broad here and work down more specific, but I'm sure that many of you are aware that climate is changing. Um, so for example, global temperatures and carbon dioxide are rising Precipitation patterns are changing, so some areas are getting wetter while other areas are getting drier. And in general, extreme events are becoming more frequent, so this can be things like hurricanes or droughts or, in this case, fire too. So this is very broad. I'm not going to go into any details, but just setting the stage here a little bit. The next factor is fire. And I know that you have heard about this um, in the previous two sessions, so I won't go into a ton of detail here. But fire is changing. Um, and I think we can all say that we've noticed this, particularly in the Western US. <laughs> um, but there are many different factors that influence fire and, and are many different reasons why fire is changing, including, again, the influence of climate. Um, but also things like changes in vegetation. So this could be either through land use or in this case, maybe um, invasive species, invasive plants. And then there's also certainly a human influence on this as well. So a lot of the work in um, the group that I'm in at the University of Colorado Boulder is on the human influence, looking at things like how many ignitions are caused by humans versus how many are caused by lightning and things like that. Um, and we know that humans um, in the last several decades have caused more than 80% of the fires across the US. So this is a big influence. Um, but together, all of these different things are leading to more fires in some cases, larger fires in some cases. Um, both of those are true. And then the last factor is the invasive plant piece. So invasive plants are quite costly. Um, on an average year in the US, we spend about $8 billion managing invasive plants which is insane. <laughs> um, and they're also very difficult to manage. Um, they're, they happen to be quite successful oftentimes in their new environments. Um, so these are just a couple different examples of invasive plants in the Western US that are shown here. Um, a couple that I'll talk about today are cheatgrass and buffelgrass. But the upshot of this is that they're changing native ecosystems and the services and properties that those native ecosystems have. Um, so this, I, for me, this is really interesting to understand what effects these invasives are having on the native systems. So in Idaho specifically, um, oh, so one quick note here, I will mostly talk about um, invasive plants today as invasive plants. They're called different things in different contexts and they do have slightly different meanings. So um, a lot of states, for example, call them noxious weeds and those are anything that they manage. Um, another term that's often used is exotic plants. And the, again, these do have slightly different meanings. Um, for the purposes of today's talk, I will kind of use them interchangeably. Um, so don't get too hung up on the terminology, but Idaho has over 70 different plants um, or noxious weeds that are actively managed. So I put a link in here. Okay, did that go to the new website or are you still on my presentation? You're okay, great. Okay, so this site has all of the plants that Idaho actively manages. And so you can scroll down here. This is really cool because you get like photos of these different things. And then if you click on one, let's say we go to yellow devil hawkweed, <laughs> um, it gives you all kinds of information about a summary, a description of what this plant looks like, how it was introduced, how you might prevent it, all kinds of really cool information. So this is a great resource. Um, and I can share my presentation with you at the end if that would be helpful if you're interested in any of these links or anything. 
Okay. So that is just a link to all of the plants that they're managing currently in Idaho. Um, so I wanted to give you a chance. Again, I'll stop sharing my screen here and we'll jump back over to Mentimeter. But I just wanted to just gauge, um, you know, what changes have you noticed when you're out going for a hike or walking your dog or <laughs> something like that? Um, have you seen any invasive plants in Idaho or other changes in vegetation? So things like you know, along a roadside or um, or even I'm interested if you've noticed any changes in the condition of the vegetation. For example, are areas drying out or anything like that? I'm just really looking for, you know, some of your observations here. So we'll jump over to Mentimeter. And I think I have to advance it to the next slide. Oh, gosh. Okay, are you seeing a new slide yet? Or are you still on the first question? First question, shoot. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, how about now? Are you on the second question? I can see the second question. Great, okay. Cool. So I'd just love to hear your observations. Have you noticed any invasive plants around Idaho? Okay. We've got some results rolling in. I'll start sharing my screen here. <laughs> okay. We've got bark beetle. <laughs> yep. <Yeah>, okay. <laughs> Oh, wow, that second one I'm not even familiar with. Oh, here they come. Wow, this is really cool. Is butter and eggs actually a plant? Is that a thing? Okay, <laughs> awesome. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> oh, this is great. Wow. Yep. Uh, my personal fave is seeds stuck in the socks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Foothills are green. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this is great. Cool. So it's, yeah, I mean, these things are becoming more common and certainly you can notice in your daily life, just, you know, changes in vegetation are happening. So this is really cool. Um, cheatgrass being the number one. So the words are arranged here based on the number of times that each entry was uh, recorded. So cheatgrass seems to be a common one here. Okay, so we'll flip back to the presentation. Okay. Okay, so in addition to the um, species that you maybe have already seen, um, it's possible that others are going to become problematic in the future as well. So one of the reasons for this is this relationship between um, a changing climate and invasive plants. So climate change can shift where invasive plants are found as these plants respond to the new temperatures of, or sorry, respond to the new conditions of temperature, CO2, and precipitation. Additionally, um, rising temperatures often favor invasive plants because they can have earlier or longer growing seasons. So they come in first and get established and outcompete the native plants in this way. So one figure that I'm gonna show you here um, this is from a study done in 2016 by some colleagues of mine. And what they did is they mapped um, the invasive plants that are going to be found in a region 
in the year or by the year 2050. So looking into the future, what species are going to be found in each state in the US and then color coded it according to the number of new invasive plants that are going to be found there. And so areas in red are areas that are going to have more invasive plants in the future and areas in blue are going to have fewer invasive plants in the future. And so what you see is that, especially in northern latitudes, there's going to be an increase in invasive plants in the future. And the reason for this is that as temperatures warm, species are generally migrating northward in the U.S. to get to a, a climate that's more suitable and more similar to the climate that they're found in currently. So if you look at Idaho, there are sections there are sections that are blue or like more neutral, but there are also some sections that are red that are going to experience more invasive plants in the future. So this was really interesting work, I thought. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. And then another way that climate and invasives interact is through um, extreme events. And so things like drought or fire or whatever the event is can stress the native ecosystem and leave the um, native community more susceptible to invasion in the future. So these are a couple ways of uh, the climate invasive interaction. Okay, then there's also the fire invasive interaction, which I think is totally fascinating. Um, I'm gonna to talk today about the grass fire cycle. Um, and so basically, if you look on the left-hand side here, you might have a system that was originally woody. And what happens through a number of different or pathways, I guess you could say you, there's e an introduction of an invasive plant or land clearing or something. Um, and then you end up with um, an invasive plant being brought in. And then you have the situation where invasive grasses can promote more frequent fire. And so this is because they provide a more favorable climate, a microclimate. So this is like small on the ground stuff where it can often get hotter and drier if you have a small little grass that's replacing like a shrub or something like that. And they're also very flammable, like the plants themselves are very flammable and they create kind of this carpet in between, like if you picture uh, cheatgrass, it creates almost this carpet in between like the sagebrush plants. And so that can help really fuel a fire into much larger areas. So it creates all this flammable fuel. So that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it is that it also, um, these plants in general, I was talking about cheatgrass specifically, but these plants in general um, tend to do better after a fire than the native plants that they're out competing. And so overall you have this selection for a grass. So you move from the system that was woody into something that's more like a grassland or savanna. And so this cycle here, this positive feedback is what's known as the grass fire cycle. Okay, so we've gone through a bunch of these interactions now, and I'm going to run through quickly and just summarize. Um, we've talked about almost all of these, but um, basically between invasive species and climate, we know that the ranges of invasive species are shifting as climate shifts, and climate change can also stress native systems, leading to greater risk of invasion between climate and fire, we know that fires are becoming more frequent by climate change for a whole host of reasons. Um, and then, sorry, I have to move my, I can't see the window or the windows in the way here. Oh, and then fire promotes more invasive species because they tend to do better after a fire and invasive grasses also create more fuel for the fire. So there's that positive feedback. The two that we haven't really talked about um, that I am interested in are on the inside of the triangle here. So I've done a lot of work on how carbon storage changes as a result of invasive species. So this is another feedback in between invasives and climate. And then there's also this feedback over here on the right hand side where carbon is released in situations where you have more frequent fire. So this can be a feedback 
between fire and climate. And we won't really talk about that one a whole lot today. But the end result is that um, as these invasive plants and the fire and all of these things are changing, you can end up with situations that are quite different and completely novel ecosystems, completely novel vegetation types um, due to all these different changing and interacting factors. Okay, so I wanted to pause for just a moment I know I went through all of that quickly and there's a lot there, but I wanted to give you a chance to just ask any questions you have about these different feedbacks or um, anything like that. So we'll jump over one last time to Mentimeter and I'll share the results from that, but I just wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions that you have. Okay, so they should start coming up here. Or if you prefer, you can also just ask a question verbally. That's fine too. <laughs> so see, I can't remember now if you're gonna get into this later, but um, if not, what is the relationship between um, moving towards more um, grass, invasive grasses and carbon storage? It depends. It depends on a number of things. I will show one example um, for cheatgrass and sagebrush in the Great Basin, where in the case of like a larger shrubby type vegetation being replaced by something smaller like cheatgrass, carbon storage is going to be reduced. That's not always the case, and it depends on what is the invader and what is the native mm, species yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, often if an invasive grass is coming in and replacing something that's bigger, you'll get reduced carbon storage. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yes, this is a great question. Um, oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, Chelsea, do you want to read that? Do you want me to read the question or do you want to read them in case people aren't on this page? Yep, I can read them. Um, and I, um, yes, I will try to answer these as best I can, as succinctly as I can. <laughs> okay, so the first question, are there any negative feedbacks that might counteract some of these processes? Um, yes, there are. Um, so one example that's coming to mind that is not about invasives necessarily, but rather just about fire and changing vegetation. Um, there was a really cool paper that just came out looking at the boreal forest. And it, um, it was a case where the spruce forest is being replaced by aspen and birch, which is really interesting. Um, as a result of more fire in the boreal forest region. And actually they're finding that the new forest stores more carbon than the spruce forest that it's replacing and could actually serve as a negative feedback um, to these systems. And um, I don't believe that uh, aspen or birch are invasive in that area or like exotic to that area, but it's a different community than was there initially. Um, so that's one interesting example that I've read about recently. But I think a lot of work is being done in this area and um, we might find some more examples of this. Okay, um, has your work included how grazing? Yes, well, my work uh, specifically has not. I will touch just briefly on grazing later in the presentation. So I might pause on that one for now and come back. Um, what would happen if it, if we got out of the way? This is a great question, and I also um, will come back to this at the end in the in the context of the RAD framework, um, because one of the options in RAD is to accept 
And so basically you do nothing. And there are a number of reasons why you might choose this pathway. Um, the, the second part about would a new equilibrium result? Often, yes. Um, the concept of an ecological tipping point is that once you pass some threshold, if, um, if the case is your cheatgrass and it gets too crazy and completely outcompetes your sagebrush, then yes, you might end up in a case where um, you have a new equilibrium and it's just going to be cheatgrass forever until something else comes in and changes it. Um, okay, the next question, a key message put out there to promote the main actions needed for managing. The key message, okay, we'll come back to this one too. <laughs> the key message I'd say for management is really that you have to manage for kind of all of these factors at once, which sounds like nearly impossible because targeting one of these things is hard enough. You know, if you're spending $8 billion a year just managing for invasives, and then you also have to manage for fire and climate change too, it can get pretty overwhelming very fast. Um, I, th I do think the RAD framework is helpful and it, and it might be the case where like you, you kind of pick your battles in terms of management where maybe you save a small portion of the area of sagebrush or whatever it is that you are really concerned about. And then kind of you, ha you might have to let another part of it go, something like that. Um, okay, the last one I see up here is what strategies can we use to help us live with invasives? This is a really great question. I don't know that I have an answer for it. Um, we're thinking a lot about this in terms of fire too. So for fire, it's a bit easier because there are things you can do around your home, for instance, like make sure that you don't have um, vegetation directly touching your house so that your house doesn't catch on fire, things like that. Um, but those could be applied here to invasives too. Um, because it's totally true, we're gonna live in a world with more fire, we're gonna live in a world with more invasives. And so we just have to learn how to adapt to that, basically, I think. Um, so hopefully this, the third part of the talk today will give you a couple more answers to fill in these gaps that I just glossed over here. Okay. All right, I'm gonna switch gears again. I think that's the last time we'll be jumping back and forth. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Okay. So um, just a couple other quick points here. I My story today is about invasive grasses and fire because that's what I personally study, but um, I don't wanna leave out some of these other very important invasives. So. Bark beetle in particular is a big problem in the western U.S. and especially in areas where you have a bark beetle infestation and then it gets compounded with something like a drought and then possibly a fire, you can end up with very large um, areas of forest that die off. So this is a, a really big problem that I don't want to discount here. It's just not the focus of my talk today. And similarly, invasive um, shrubs, trees, and aquatic species are found all over the U.S. and worldwide. But again, I, I just don't have time and my expertise is not in those things. So um, we'll just skip those for today. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this, but um, yeah, you're likely to see some of these things in your lifetime in Idaho. And I know certainly in Colorado, we have been experiencing some of these things, you know, last summer was terrible in terms of uh, fires and air quality and, and things like that. Um, so I've ex certainly experienced some of these firsthand. Um, I think, yeah, I think the key is going to be trying to manage for all of these factors kind of together and maybe try to focus more on the resilience of the ecosystem um, as a whole rather than just say eradicating this one small patch of cheatgrass or something like that. Um, and the implications are huge, right? So if we've all experienced and seen these uh, changes firsthand, um, that's just visually what's happening in terms of the 
the native ecosystems, but there are all kinds of other consequences for things like carbon storage and biodiversity and a whole host of other ecosystem processes that will be changing along with these. Okay, so um, I wanted to shift gears and talk briefly about some work that I've done with cheatgrass specifically. Um, so this map that's on the right hand side here is showing cheatgrass cover. So with the darker dots um, indicating a greater um, coverage of cheatgrass. So for instance, the black dots have over 50% cover of cheatgrass. So you notice, I'm, and again, cheatgrass came out as the number one um, observation in our word cloud today. Um, cheatgrass is definitely um, occurring in Idaho. And so um, cheatgrass leads to many different changes in ecosystem properties, um, including carbon storage, biodiversity, nutrient cycling, and water availability. And so the study that I did recently on cheatgrass was specifically looking at um, carbon storage. There's a link to it in this um, slide here if you care to learn more about it. But the upshot was I did a synthesis of all the work that has been done to date on comparing cheatgrass and sagebrush ecosystems um, for any study that measured how much carbon was stored either above ground in the plants themselves or below ground in the soil. And what I found was that um, the cheatgrass areas stored a lot less carbon above ground in the plants themselves. And again, this isn't hard to imagine because if you picture like a big sagebrush bush getting replaced by a small little grass, um, you can understand why the carbon storage is going down. There are two other things I wanna point out here. Um, changes in soil carbon storage can also occur, particularly deeper in the soil. In again, if you picture those two plants, the sagebrush has much deeper roots and greater biomass below ground. And therefore, when you replace it again with a small little cheat grass, grass <laughs> um, then there's less carbon being put into the soil as well. So you might end up with a case where you're losing soil carbon over time, particularly deeper in the soil. And finally, um, this relationship is very dependent on whether or not a, the, the system, wherever it is, has burned. And so in the case where you're in the beginning stages of cheatgrass invasion, like say you're in some of these lighter color dots where you have zero to 5% cover of cheatgrass or something like that, and it hasn't yet burned, then you might get a temporary increase in carbon storage. Because you can imagine those little grass plants coming in and filling in in between the sagebrush. They just fill in the bare ground. And so then you might get a temporary increase in carbon. But then once the cheat grass has become the dominant plant and excluded the, the sagebrush, or after a fire, where again, the cheatgrass excludes the sagebrush, then you definitely see a huge decline in carbon storage. So that was a really cool study, I thought, <laughs> um, just to synthesize all the work that was out there because so many individual studies have been done on the cheatgrass sagebrush relationship. And then one other example that I've done recently, so I don't believe that buffalo grass is found in Idaho. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we went down to Tucson to do a study. So this was actually a field study that we did um, to look at this relationship of how buffalo grass changes carbon storage. Um, and so this is in um, some of the, the saguaro, um, for, uh, saguaro desert areas. <laughs> and so what we did is we went and set up these plots in the field and we measured all the vegetation that was there and collected soil samples and then analyzed everything for carbon storage. And we're just getting back the final results from this right now, but it looks like a very similar story to cheatgrass, where initially when the buffalo grass comes in, you might get initial increase in carbon storage because it's just filling in like the bare spaces in between the native vegetation. Um, 
But then we expect that after a fire, or in the case, you know, if the buffalo grass becomes completely dominant and excludes all the native vegetation, then you would get a decrease in carbon storage in this region. And it was really crazy while we were there um, sampling, we drove by this site that was like just down the road from where we were sampling and this fire had just occurred and we were like, oh man, I wish we could go sample there. <laughs> but it was like, you know, all roped off and everything it was still burning. So <laughs> we'll have to go back in a few years and see what the case was there. Um, but it was crazy to see this happening like live while we were there sampling. Um, Okay, so this is the third and final part of the talk today, but um, I do think it's really important, especially for your audiences to think about, okay, all these things are happening, what do we do now? And like, how are people thinking about how to manage for these different factors? So this is called the RAD framework. Um, the RAD comes from resist, accept, and direct. And so um, there's the link to a paper that describes this framework here if you're interested to learn more. But the basic idea of this framework is like, first you think about, okay, the, the very first question is like, are you shaping the trajectory of change? If no, for whatever reason, and I'll talk about some of the reasons, then you fall over here in this accept category. If you're able or willing to shape this um, or change it in some way, then you're over here. And then your second question becomes, are you aiming to maintain the historical or the baseline condition? Or are you open to or willing to accept some kind of new condition? And that dictates whether you fall in the resist camp or the direct camp. Okay, so to give you a little more concept, or context, again, the resist, accept, direct. Um, what specific path you choose is going to be dependent on the context. So you might have state or agency mandates in place that say what you're able to do or what the priorities are or something like that. You also, of course, have to consider the available resources. So if you're in a district or um, a county or something that just doesn't have much money to put towards these things, then you might be limited in the management that you can do. Um, natural resource managers consistently say that the top two reasons that they can't manage invasive species is lack of time and lack of money. So that unfortunately dictates what is possible in some cases. And then there's also the state of the native system to consider. So what I mean by that is if the native vegetation is already very degraded, for example, or if the invasive plant is already very widespread, then you might be a bit limited in what you can do. Okay, so if you remember the first branching from the previous figure, are you willing to do something, yes or no? <laughs> if no, you fall in the accept category. Okay, so many changes will be accepted because it's infeasible to be managed. It's The management practices aren't going to be very impactful. There are some cases where it would be acceptable by stakeholders. Um, remember that a lot of invasives are actually introduced intentionally, at least in the beginning until maybe they get out of control or something like that. Um, or it might be accepted if it's happening in some very remote area and no one knows about it. Or again, if there's just a lack of will or no one really cares, it's, it doesn't seem to be having that big of an impact on people's daily lives, then you might be in the accept category. Okay, if you're willing, to do, willing and able to do something about it, and you're managing for the historical or baseline condition, then you're in the resist category. So many changes will be resisted in order to, again, maintain if the ideal situation is the baseline condition, the sagebrush or whatever it is, then you might find yourself over here in the resist category. And then lastly, if you can do something about it, but you're open to a new condition perhaps, then you might be in the direct category. So some changes will be directed towards a specific state because 
it's possible that resisting is um, untenable. It's just maybe the cheatgrass has come in and completely excluded all the sagebrush, <laughs> but you might be able to um, steer the cheatgrass in some way that's more desirable, something like that. Um, so this is slightly different from the acceptance because you can kind of direct it a little bit to where you want to go. Okay, so I'll, I'll take one more shot at kind of explaining this framework in the context of sagebrush and cheatgrass. Um, so again, you're going to think about things like what state or agency mandates are in place, what resources are available, and what the native system is like in, in the area that you're managing. So how resilient or resistant to change is the sagebrush that's left? And then how dominated by cheatgrass is the landscape that you're working in? So if you have a, a case where either um, the resilience of sagebrush is quite low or in the case where cheatgrass is already very prevalent, then you are probably going to end up in either the accept or the resist category, depending on how many resources or, you know, the amount of resources that you have available. If you find yourself in the direct category, you might start thinking about ways that you could improve the cheatgrass ecosystem in some way. So, for instance, if you're concerned about biodiversity or carbon storage, you might think about what are there other species that could coexist for cheatgrass that you could introduce there to make it a more diverse system or, or something like that. Um, so that's just my attempt at um, applying this framework to a context that might be familiar to you all. And then in terms of specific management approaches, I won't go into a ton of detail here, but um, prescribed burning and grazing are two of the very common ones in the Western US. And so for prescribed burning, you go out with this little drip torch and actually light an area on fire, which seems kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and it can be quite effective, um, particularly if you just have a small little area that's invaded by something that you're trying to get rid of. Um, I will say the one caution I have here is for things like cheatgrass, that are that can be caught up in this grass fire cycle you need to be careful that you get all of it otherwise you might just find yourself in a situation where you're actually promoting more cheatgrass which would be a huge bummer um so you have to make sure that you get all of it and remove all of the cheatgrass seeds otherwise that's not going to be very effective but prescribed burning is used quite a bit and can be effective in some cases and the second one is grazing um and this can be effective in certain cases as well. So one advantage, I guess, over the prescribed burning is, again, it can be used for things that do have this positive feedback with fire um, and doesn't introduce more fire to the landscape, which can be good. Um, one downside that I've noticed from grazing in certain contexts um, is that depending on the duration of how long you have the cows out there and, and everything like that, um, they can in some cases make the soil more compact just by like trampling on it a lot, and they're heavy, <laughs> um, which can be problematic for some plants then to get established if the soil is super compact. So, I mean, in any of these cases, there are certainly pluses and minuses to all of them. And it's somewhat just context specific on which particular management strategy is going to work best for you. Okay, I wanted to share just a couple cool examples that I thought um, of tools that I've run across recently. Um, so the first one, I'm going to click on this here and then I should just be able to go to this website. And hopefully you can all see that on my screen now. So this first one is called EdMaps. And this is this website contains the data that was used to make that figure that I showed at the beginning with like the red and blue areas that are either gaining or expected to gain or expected to lose invasive species. 
And so this site has that data. So you could potentially make your own map. So you would go in here and you can select Idaho, for instance. You can select a particular county. Um, and then this over here is less important, but this is just like choosing the number of models that have to agree. So you can set your threshold really low or really high. It doesn't really matter. But then if you look down here on the right hand side, you can see all the species. And so this is again running through the year. I think the range is like 2040 to 2060. So let's say 2050 on average, but it'll show you all of the species that are going to show up or expected to show up in your area, which is really cool. Um, so that's one cool tool. And then the second one that I thought was pretty neat, and I haven't played around with this one all that much, to be honest, um, but this, you can download all kinds of stuff from this site. It includes data on um, fire and invasive plants and um, specifically, they're looking at sage grouse habitat, so sagebrush, um, and looking at factors like wildfire, conifer expansion, and invasive grasses. And then you can choose the different subregions that you want to work in here in the Great Basin. So you could, you know, pick one that covers Idaho. Um, this is another cool tool that I haven't yet had a, a much chance to explore myself, but I'm really excited about. Um, okay, so I wanted to take just a few minutes. I guess I, I went a little long, but let's take five minutes and just talk about, um, I just wanted to open this up for discussion. So given all that we've talked today about fire and invasives and climate, how might you facilitate learning about this to the very different audiences that you are working with? And I'll give, yeah, I'll give you a chance to talk now. Sorry, I've been talking a lot, but. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to just throw something out or you could um, verbally or in the chat, either way is totally great. So I will just um, pipe up that what this picture is showing is what I would say is probably one of the best ways of just taking people out to see for themselves and compare and contrast some places and just get to know things. Um, a lot of people have heard of cheatgrass, but in my experience, when they come to a workshop, teachers don't know which one it is. So even just the basics of getting out there and then um, burn some of the different things and see what happens in small little plates, yep. little tin pan. Yep, cool. That's a great idea, I love that. Um, it's really easy because a lot of people are visual learners and so like it's it's completely different just like hearing something, hearing about something versus being out there in the field. So yeah, I love that suggestion. Yeah, I work in a park in southern Idaho and so we actually kind of the ecosystem that we operate in is this combination of the sagebrush step and the northern Great Basin. And so we have sagebrush steppe and pinyon juniper woodlands. And we actually have um, maybe like a 20 year old burn on like the, the farther west side of the park. Um, and I was actually out on a hike the other day looking out and you can see the barren kind of hills that we have. And then um, I'm actually gonna be leading a hike there on Memorial Day um, oh, cool. weekend. Yeah. And so I was even just thinking, you know, what is my kind of theme for this hike and it's it's totally it's land use changes because we're clearly seeing impacts of fire um the california trail came through here we have mining that used to occur here we have grazing currently so it's like absolutely this like perfect combination of like land use changes and so um yeah i'm excited to like incorporate more of this to think about um and yeah kind of factoring in climate change in there because I think people see the grazing they see maybe impacts of fire and maybe kind of know about species um but not necessarily thinking about this broader view like you started with which was climate change <laughs> yep cool that's so exciting oh my gosh yeah I wish I could go on that hike with you <laughs> that sounds awesome <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so I, I work as an environmental educator and so I'm mostly working with younger audiences. Um, and so one thing that I think is often really useful is metaphors, especially okay. with things that are a little bit hard to like directly demonstrate depending on where you are. I was curious if you've kind of in your work come across kind of like metaphors or way of like framing or structuring that helps people to get their heads around it. And I think that's useful, not just for kids, but also for adults as well. Totally. That is an excellent point. I haven't thought of that, but I certainly will now. <laughs> um, that is an excellent point because everyone, yeah, it's easier for everyone to latch onto something and grasp an idea if it's less like technical and it's just like, oh yeah, I can relate to that thing. Gosh, can anyone think of one on the spot? <laughs> yeah, this is a great group to ask. Yeah. We heard a metaphor last week about credit card debt, that the accumulation of fuels in the um, in a forest ecosystem, and it would probably be the same for cheat grass as well, yeah. um, is like accruing debt that we can't pay off. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you get debt from different sources, you know, <laughs> different kinds of spending. <laughs> different interest rates. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You I like that one. Yeah, yeah I, I think we could work with that. <laughs> I think we have time for one more um, either question for Chelsea or um, suggestion about uh, application. Yeah. I was just going to say for Isaac, um, the uh, that same presenter also compared doing prescribed burning to vacuuming. Hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, especially Chelsea, you have your carpet of of cheap right. grass. Let's just vacuum it up. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, it's perfect. For all the homemakers out there. Yeah. We use all of the cleaning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea, for being with us today and for all of this um, information. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure if, if you're willing to post your email address in the chat, I bet yeah. um, people would want to follow up with more questions potentially about um, invasives and fire and climate change and those interactions. So if um, folks are willing, you can turn on your mics and give Chelsea a round of applause. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Oh, thank you all. <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> oh, there we go. Elizabeth has got it with the little Penny, you're on the <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um, Tristan is going to close this out for us. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you, Chelsea, for the wonderful presentation. Um, just as a reminder, we have one more session on Tuesday, April 27th from 3 to 4 p.m. Um, Pacific time and 4 to 5 mountain time. This will be Fire in My Belly, sharing Idaho stories of fire in place-based education programs. Um, so myself and Kayla are actually going to host this one and discuss how we can take um, storytelling narratives and incorporate that along with climate and fire science and um, translate that across your different types of classrooms in so many disciplines um, to connect and inspire people personally. And we also want to thank you for um, filling out the evaluation. If you don't mind doing that, that helps us so much um, to get feedback and um, hear your experiences with these workshops. So thank you again.